This interview was recorded on March 4th, 2021. Hi, I'm Len Epp from LeanPub, and in this episode of the Front Matter Podcast, I'll be interviewing Lee Baker. Based in Scotland, Lee is a physicist, statistician, and programmer who is CEO and co-founder of Chi Squared Innovations, which helps scientists and businesses analyze, visualize, and model their data. You can follow him on Twitter at EelRaycab, which is Lee Baker backwards, basically, and check out his website at Chi2Innovations.com. Lee is the author of a number of books available on LeanPub, including Multivariate Analysis, The Simplest Guide in the Universe, A Holistic Strategy to Discover All the Relationships in Your Data, How to Lie with Numbers, Stats, and Graphs, a box set containing truth, lies, and statistics, and graphs don't lie, and most recently, Getting Started with Statistics, a series of bite-sized guides for beginners. In this interview, we're going to talk about Lee's background and career, professional interests, his books, and at the end, we'll talk a little bit about his experience writing and self-publishing. So, thank you, Lee, for being on the Front Matter Podcast. It's great to be here, Lynn. Um, I always like to start these interviews by asking people for their origin story, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about where you grew up and how you found your way into a career in data science. Oh, well, that's actually a really, really long story, but I'll, I'll try and give you the, the bite-sized version of it. Uh, I, I started out originally as a, as a physicist, and I, I never had any interest in, uh, in, in doing anything with, with data, really, but... Um, I, I just sort of uh, sort of fell into it almost by accident. I uh, I did a couple of master's degrees uh, in which I sort of moved away from my my real passion, which was uh, which was medicine. Uh, I did my first master's in in medical physics, uh, uh, and it, it was only after that that I started to work with with data in in different areas, and I, I started to get really interested in in what you can do with data, and these were really huge data sets at the time what what you might call big data although that that particular term has been it's, it's completely out of proportion now from what it was back then you need specialist tools now which you didn't need back then but uh i, I was analyzing these 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 large data sets and, and and starting to get a passion for um for telling stories with the data the data itself I didn't really particularly like, and nor did I like statistics. And I, I'm a self self taught statistician, and I didn't like the statistics. It's 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 a really annoying thing to have to do, um, but I just absolutely loved shaping the data and discovering things in it, and being able to tell stories, the story of of that data, and it, it, that's that's my passion, and that's what I uh, I, I really love doing. Um, and so I, I I write a lot of. I know we're going to talk about the books, but we I write write books for beginners to help them along that journey to um, to be able to tell stories with the data, rather than thinking of statistics as being just some kind of a tool. And um, are you from Scotland originally? I'm not. I'm uh, I'm a, a very proud Yorkshireman. I, I came up to Scotland many years ago, back in '99, uh, just to finish off my education. I, I think they must have uh, closed the gate behind me because uh, they, they've not let me out since. Uh, and you studied artificial intelligence as well. I did. My my PhD was in that, and that that was that was a bit of a strange time because. Um, I, I, I got a, a supervisor who uh, who was interested in me doing a PhD, and it, it gave me a it gave me a, a, a CD with some data on it and uh, and a, an academic paper, and said, C "Can you do something like that with these data?" And these were agricultural data. It was all about soil. I'd never done anything to do with soil before. Uh, and so I looked at it, and the, this paper was about uh, using uh, artificial neural networks with some uh, some soil data. And I, I had a good read of, read of it, and didn't understand most of it. But uh, I, I took my time with it, spent a few days combing through it, and uh, and after a while, I thought, actually, yeah, I can, I can do do uh, do something with this. Uh, so he he offered me uh, a, a scholarship doing a, doing a PhD, and. Uh, uh, and so that's where I, I started doing uh, doing neural networks. I'd never done anything like it before, but uh, yeah, I was I was really excited about it. It was it was a really interesting time, a really steep learning curve. I'd never never done anything quite like it before, but uh, yeah, that, that was uh, that was a good time. It's really curious, actually, speaking specifically about the time that was starting about uh, twenty years ago. Um, uh, I'm just looking at your LinkedIn profile that you that you began your PhD. What was the work like at the time? I mean, did you work in a big? Did you have a big lab that you had to go to every day? Did you have a supercomputer available or anything like that? Oh God, no! Supercomputers. Wow, that that would have been nice. No, what we what we had was I just I just turned up to my office every day. I got a bog standard computer, uh, and most of the the uh, the neural network stuff we had to code it ourselves. And and, and I was a, an absolutely terrible programmer. 
and, and I had to learn to program so I could then program neural networks uh, and, and then do all of that. And then um, during the summertime, uh, when all the students uh, disappeared and all the computing labs were, uh, were, were free, we'd then go and link computers up uh, so we could get some extra computing power. Uh, of course, we have we have things like uh, uh, Hadoop and Spark now to be able to do these things for you, but you, you couldn't do it back then. It didn't exist. You had to actually go in and physically link these computers up and tell them to to, to work with each other. And I had to get the, the the tech guys to come and help me to do it. But we linked up all these computers, got all this extra computing power, and and so most of the work actually was done during the summers when there was there's no students there. And I spent months then back at my desk. Uh, wondering what, why the hell it's so slow <laughs> when I don't have 20 computers all linked up. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing that. It's really interesting, this this podcast in a way, because so many people um, uh, have worked with, with computers that have written Lean Pub books. Uh, the, the podcast has become a bit of a kind of archive of stories of people from various eras uh, in computing telling about how they used to do things. And it makes me think that, you know, I remember... You know, when I started going to university in the mid 90s, hearing stories about people are like, you know, we used to be able to smoke in class and we also had to do punch cards for the computers. And I'm sure that people who sort of started university like just a few years ago are thinking about well, actually physically hauling around and physically linking up computers to get more power. That's I understand that's the way it used to be, but it sounds nuts. Yeah, it, it does. Uh, and it, it's, it's strange thinking, thinking back to the, 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 the different eras, because when I just first started doing my, my, my PhD and, and the office that I was talking about, uh, it had just recently been refurbished. And before that, it used to be the staff bar. <laughs> so, I mean, wh where do you get a staff bar in a university these days? <laughs> you don't. You know, and times, they, ju they just keep changing and, and, and trying try to keep up with things can, can be, a, it can spin your head a bit. Yeah. And, um, Actually, I just want one thing before we move on. I just wanted to ask you a little bit. You said you did your first master's in medical physics. Uh, mm -hmm. And for people who aren't accustomed to hearing those two words together, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what medical physics is. Sure. Um, it's, it's where um, medicine and technology meet. So um, you've got the, the, the doctors that go and, and make their diagnoses, but what, how do they make their di diagnoses? They, they'll put people in, into a, a, a CT scanner or, or a, a PET scanner or uh, some, some kind of a scanner, ultrasound scanner, and then they get the results back and then they use those, those results to be able to make their diagnoses. Well, all those machines that you use, that's what me medical physics is all about. It's about uh, creating those machines and making them better. Uh, basically, it, it's machines to look inside the body without without having to open the body up uh, and get inside. All right. So, um, you know, bombarding the body with some kind of rays to get information about what's going on inside and things like that. Yeah, that's that's usually the way. Yeah, uh, okay. it may be radiation or or it may be uh, sound waves or light waves. There's, there are many, many different facets to medical physics. But yeah, it's 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 usually uh, it's usually done with <laughs> with some kind of radiation. OK, OK, thanks. And so, okay, so um, getting back to, to your story, so you studied physics, you studied medical physics, uh, you ended up doing some artificial intelligence and soil work, uh, and you finished a PhD, um, and then you faced the choice that everyone who finishes a PhD faces, um, which I did myself at one point, which is, should I pursue a career in academia, or should I do something else? And you chose to do something else, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about why you made that choice. Yeah, it, um, actually, there's a, there's a big chunk in between there that um, I, after I finished my PhD, um, I then uh, went back into the, the medical arena. Uh, and uh, very strangely, I got, it, it's a convoluted path, and, and I'm, not, I'm not going to go every, through every step, but I ended up becoming a, a medical statistician um, without ever having done any real statistics. I, I found myself in a, in a research group and I was very strong at maths. Um, and I could, uh, I, I could work with, I was really good at working with data, but I'd not really done very much statistics. Um, and I found myself helping everybody else to do their data analysis. So they offered me the job of statistician. So then I had to start doing a lot of statistics. And learning about it all and I I started actually rather than doing the statistics because I didn't like doing it I started programming the 
statistics, writing computer programs to do it for me, to do all the, all the hard work for me. Uh, and I really, really loved doing that because it, it made sure that I didn't have to do the one thing that I didn't want to do, which was actually do the statistics. Um, so, and and it, it is a really important path because it was at that point that I realized there was a, a huge gap uh, out there in society uh, for computed statistics. Statistics is, is something where you, you, you start doing a piece of analysis and then you, you've done a little bit of analysis and then you have to do exactly the same analysis all over again on a, a slightly different piece of data. And then you do the same analysis again on another piece of different data. And you keep repeating the same tasks over and over and over again. And it can take you months to do it. And that's why I started programming the statistics. Now, you, I think you can imagine that there are a lot of companies out there that have got a lot of data and they need to be able to do the same kind of analyses time and time and time again. Basically, they need to automate it. And there aren't that many companies out there who, who have the ability to be able to uh, create statistical applications for companies to use, bespoke applications for specifically written, uh, built for, for them. So that that was that was what I, I I realized there was a gap out there, and I decided it's time for me to uh, basically expand my horizons, get get out there into the real world, and and start to help as many companies uh, as I can. And that's and that was that's the origins of of my company, Chi Squared Innovations. And yeah, I just actually wanted to ask you specifically about that. Um, a, a number of Lean Pub authors that we've interviewed for the podcast are sort of independent types uh, who've made the choice to go and create their own companies and do consulting and and things like that. And I was wondering. If you remember back back in the day, how did you go about getting your first clients? Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a certain amount of uh, doing your own legwork, getting out there. You you, you go and network, and and uh, you 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 meet a lot of people. You shake a lot of hands. You drink a lot of coffee, uh, and. There's also the other side of it where people who already know you say, oh. I, 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 this company's got a problem, and I know somebody who can who can can sort this out, and and they they, they come and put you together. Uh, so there's 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 a there's a lot of work that you have to do for yourself to try and find clients, but there's also that little piece of luck of of knowing the right person and that person thinking of you at just the right time. Uh, but yeah, it was a a, a real hard slog. Uh, at the beginning for every it's, and it's the same for every company it's not just us uh, trying to get your first clients uh, and not just for your first clients but then getting your next sort of set of clients especially if you're if you're working really hard on a project for a client right now you're on your computer you're working hard every day every week every month and when you get to the end of it you don't have another client because you've been too busy on the project that you've been doing while you're in your office doing work, you're not out there in the world getting new clients. And so you can't, you can't be uh, the CEO and a coder at the same time. You can't do two jobs. You can't do both of those jobs. You're either in the office doing work or you're getting out of the office trying to get new work in. And that was, uh, it's obvious to anybody out there that, that's got their own business and they've been through exactly the same path. But if there's anybody listening that's thinking about setting up their business, it's it's a big learning curve. You can't be in the office and out of the office at the same time. And uh, actually, that gives me an opportunity to do a cheesy segue into the next part of the interview where we talk about, um, which we introduced into these interviews about a year ago now, uh, where we talk about the pandemic and, you know, you mentioned getting out of the office. Uh, and so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about just how the pandemic has affected your life in Scotland and how it's affected your work. Uh, oh, it's 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 been really really tough in one aspect and really easy in another, and I'll explain that in in a second. The the hard thing for for us is that we've we've got something over here called Brexit, and this has been going on for quite a few years now, and it's only just been resolved. Even though it's not been resolved, <laughs> people think it's been resolved, um, but. Brexit has been a, a big, big problem for us because we we are a research and development company. And during Brexit, companies have been saying, now's not the right time for us 
we, 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 I, w I want to talk about the things that you can do for us, the, 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 thing, the, the, the help that you can give us, but now's not quite the right time to actually go ahead and do things. So we've had a really difficult time during the, uh, the, um, the, the Brexit period, and, and this is one of the reasons why I've written so many books, because, frankly, we've, I, I told all of our staff, get out there and create a new business for yourself that's going to bring money in, that's going to keep us ticking over because we've got to work through this Brexit period until it's all done. And then just as soon as we started to get a little bit of clarity over Brexit and, and uh, companies started to come back to us and say, it might be time for us now, as soon as that happened, the pandemic hit and everybody's closed again. And, and so we've had another year on top of that. Uh, and so it's been a really, really difficult time for, for, for us as a company uh, to, to have to try to, to find alternative sources of income and, and, and Lean Pub has, has been great for us with that, uh, with publishing our books there. We've, we've got other, uh, other outlets as well. Uh, but it's been really tough for the, for the business. On the other hand, it's been really simple for me personally because um, more and more I was withdrawing to the office uh, because there wasn't so much work for us to be had out in the, the the real world. My work became in the office. So for for the last few years, I've been mostly office bound, not been getting out there very much. So when the pandemic hit, it was just business as usual. My office is uh, is up the stairs and turn left. <laughs> it's my spare room, uh, and I've been in here for several years now. Uh, it, it feels like I'm never going to get out, <laughs> but uh, but that, that's that's where we are. So it's um, it, it's very mixed messages from me when it comes to the pandemic. Difficult in some ways and uh, and very easy in others. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing that. Um, uh, that's actually not not too different from the experience that I've had described to me by other from other Lean Pub authors. Um, you know, often it is people working for, especially if they work in things having to do with computing and consulting and stuff like that. Often the office is at home, and you know the the idea of of uh, remote work is leaving your house, um, not working in it. Um, and, uh, and, but, you know, they, but pe people who do sort of client based work, you know, that's, that's, that's been, that's been a rough go for some people and it's been better than ever for others. Um, but, uh, I actually wanted to ask you specifically about Brexit. Um, I lived in the UK for about eight years, uh, ended up working in finance in the city in London. And, you know, I've been watching this Brexit stuff with a mixture of horror and fascination for a few years now. Um, uh, and I wanted to ask you specifically about Scotland. Um, I mean, I'm just asking, this is a total, like, your opinion kind of question. But what's the mood like in Scotland with generally right now with respect to things like independence and stuff like that? Because, I mean, we, we could go into all the complicated politics and history of it, but there is an independence movement in Scotland. Voters in Scotland didn't, didn't, most of them didn't vote to leave the EU. And you've got, you know, Boris Johnson and his ilk running the show. And they're typically not, they're, they're, they're neither Scotland nor Wales nor Northern Ireland nor Cornwall friendly. Um, and I know I added one there that's not a country. But, you know, what, what's the mood generally like in Scotland right now? Are people really worried? Are, are they thinking that, like, the doldrums might never end? Um it's i think it's probably fair to say that there isn't a single mood uh across anywhere in the uk about brexit um the across the uk they voted uh to leave the eu uh, by i think it was something like 52% to 48% so it was close um and then scotland decided to have a referendum to seed from the UK and uh, it went pretty much the same numbers, 52% to remain in the UK and 48% to leave. So again, very close. And it, it all depends on who you talk to as to whether they think it's, a, it's a, a good idea to leave the EU or not and about whether it's a good idea for Scotland to leave the UK or not. Um, and it's very, very easy to get into heated arguments with people about it. Um, it's, um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it, they're both very, very complicated issues and they uh, enrage passions. Um, for, for me, uh, as, a, as a business owner, the, 
what we got to do, the, the, the way that I looked at it is that um, I, I had a vote, a single vote, just as, as everybody else did, as to, as to what, uh, what we should do, whether we should leave the EU or not. Um, and I, I cast my vote. I'm not going to say which way I went. It doesn't matter. Uh, but I, I cast my vote. Uh, and, but that, that, that's where my responsibility ends. I'm not responsible for the UK leaving, to, deciding to leave or not. That's the entirety of, of the population. Um, and as a business owner, I just have to say whatever will be, will be. My job is to look at the situation and manage it as best I can. So whether we stay in the EU, I've got to deal with that. If we leave the EU, I have to deal with that too. Whatever the situation happens, I have to find a way to deal with it. And there are advantages and disadvantages to whichever path you go down. Uh, and it's my job to navigate those choppy waters. Uh, and it's the same for, for every business owner. Uh, you've just got to look for the opportunities and, and see if there are uh, ways of, of, of making uh, gains throughout it. Uh, and, and so that's that's what we've done. Uh, in, in fairness, we've had a, a very, very difficult time, not because of Brexit, but because of the uncertainty over whether Brexit was going to happen or not. Uh, and if, if, if voices continue about uh, Scottish independence, then maybe that will have uh, issues for us as, as well. Uh, but at the moment, the, the, it's, it's not an issue right now. Um, the uh, Scottish National Party, um, which is the inner majority here in Scotland, they, they're the ones that's, that's driving it forward. They're, they're the ones that's wanting to, uh, to cede from the, from the UK. And at the moment, there is not a vote on the cards. That may change in the next year or two. Who knows? Um, and we just have to see what, what the situation is from day to day and try and make the best of whatever situation we find us in, find ourselves in. Yeah, thank you very much for that um, very pragmatic answer. Um, one thing, the only, the only thing, I mean, not, not, not living there or being from there, um, the one thing I guess I could maybe add is that from from my perspective, is that the uncertainty around Brexit has affected pe business owners all around the world. Anybody who does business from or into the UK, including online commerce, um, you know, has been disrupted by the uncertainty and and by the um, the handling of the of the transition from one state of affairs to another. And we're not on the other side into a new permanent state of affairs yet. There's still so many so many things regarding trade and commerce to be worked out. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's something that everybody's had to be as realistic as, as, as they can be about it at the same time as we've all got these passions roiling, <laughs> roiling underneath. And, um, you yeah, know, sure. I mean, I, I can say, you know, if I, if I'd been there, I, I definitely would have, and I voted in UK elections. Um, I, I definitely would have voted against it. Um, uh, okay. Uh, well, uh, moving on to the next part of the, interview, I wanted to ask you about your books. Uh, you've, written, you've published many on LeanPub and they're, as you said, they're available elsewhere as well. One of my favorite ones is the one about um, how to lie with numbers, stats and graphs. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the motivation behind that book, because, you know, we're, we're all surrounded by, by data and statistics and numbers. Um, and we're presented every day. You don't have to read two headlines before you found one with some kind of statistic in it. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what your motivation was for writing that book and, and who it's for. Sure. I, I'd, um, I'd written quite a few um, statistics books before I, I wrote uh, that one. Um, and there were quite technical books for beginners, so they're not too difficult. But nevertheless, they were quite technical books. Uh, and I just decided just to, to have a little flight of fancy and, and to write about something that was much less te technical and uh, a lot more entertaining. Um, so I, I, I just I decided to, to, to go into all the different ways in which you can use numbers and statistics to deceive people. Uh, and and I, I didn't write the book uh, to teach people how to deceive. I, I, taught, I wrote the book to, to show people how they themselves are being deceived. Uh, of course, you, you, if you already know how to lie with data, um, 
as as a lay person, you need to be able to arm yourself against that. So you know you need to know the tricks of the trade that's used by uh, by the politicians, by the pharmaceutical companies, uh, by uh, uh, by the marketers. They've all got these these various tricks that they that they use to uh, to deceive. And sometimes it's not just lies. Sometimes it's lies, and sometimes it's uh, they they use absolutely correct numbers, but they use them in a slightly different way to what they really should. And they lead you up the garden path. They lead you to think things that they want you to think rather than the things that you should think. And I decided to, to write these books. This was two books that I, I, I put, put together into one. Uh, one was Truth, Lies and Stick to Statistics and the other was uh, Graphs Don't Lie. And I put them together as a, a, li a little box set. Um, one of them is about how to lie with numbers and the other is about how to lie with graphs. Uh, and I decided that I was going to write these uh, in, a, in, in as, as humorous a way as I as I possibly could, and, and keep them keep them really light and entertaining rather than uh, deep in statistics. So it's uh, I, I talk a lot about uh, things like averages, how to lie with averages, or how to lie with pie charts and thing, things like that. So not very technical at all, but but very entertaining. Uh, I've had a lot of feedback from people saying they they absolutely love those books, and I. I I, I feel good about that. That uh, it uh, it gives me encouragement to write more. Uh, yeah, and can you give us an example of how to lie with pie charts in particular? Um, lying with pie charts. Uh, yeah, th there was one example <laughs> that I gave in in the book, um, and, and this was this was from a, a, a respected uh, UK publication, uh, and they put a, a pie chart together. Uh, and when you look at the sections, you've got different sizes of different chunks and a, a larger chunk uh, had got a smaller percentage than a smaller chunk, which made no sense at all. And there was something that was on the graph that had actually had a percentage of zero. But how can you have a section on the pie chart with a zero? <laughs> uh, and, and it was you just look at it and think, oh, my God, where do I start with this? Uh, so it was, uh, it was, yeah, it was, it was a bit of a crazy situation. Uh, pie charts is one of is one of the very best ways in which uh, in which people uh, deceive, use use uh, graphs to lie to us and, and and tell us that it's one way when it's actually not. It's another. Yeah, and lying with numbers in particular, I, I you know, you're really clear about, or you you have a, some really good examples about lying with averages and things like that. And I find this is one of those things where it's like really easy to know the what's wrong but it's somehow our intuitions are easily manipulated with things like this so like you know <clears throat> excuse me i think you have one example of like if someone if there's some street uh ending in a cliff on the sea and you tell us every you tell people oh the average the average person living on this street is a millionaire uh but that can actually be incredibly deceiving because now you think everyone's a millionaire yeah yeah, you got you got all the all the, the the houses along the street that are all very normal with with uh, normal price tags, and then uh, yeah, the the the, the millionaire Ozzy Van Hendricks. At That's the, end. the name. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I I love that name. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, and that and that that house price puts the average house price of the entire street up, uh, but it it only puts the uh, it only puts the mean value up it doesn't put the median value up so if you want to you can publish publish the mean value if you want people to think your house prices are higher in this region or you can publish the median value if you want them to think that it's it's lower uh, and even the mode the mode itself the most frequently occurring number if you got a, in the within the street if you're talking about uh, uh, the income of the people who live in these houses uh, as a demonstration of, uh, of, of, of average income uh, on the street, and you've got several people who are out of work with no income, then that's the mode, the most frequently occurring number, and that's one measure of average. And so the, the average wage in the street is zero. And if that's the number that you want to put out there, it's absolutely correct because the numbers tell you it's correct but is that the real story of the data 
or are you trying to misrepresent the data? And that's, that's the important thing. That's the whole crux of the book. Yeah, and it's really good. I recommend it to anyone who's interested in it. And again, it, it's very entertaining and learning a little bit more about the ways that, that you can be manipulated and even the way that the ways that people who put together data can can sort of lead themselves down the wrong path. So they're not necessarily, in a sense, lying, but they are misrepresenting things. And the, the thing I find personally, you know, being outside the, the industry, but being so fast, I find so fascinating is that the presentation of numbers and charts themselves can it, can be a lie no matter what they're saying or no matter what their background is. For example, you know, a typical thing that you, see, you might see in, you know, is some in the publishing and book publishing industry is some consultancy puts out a presentation that says the book publishing industry is going to grow by a CAGR of 3.25% over the next five years. And you're like, oh, 0.225 to two decimal places. Well, they, mu they must really know what's going to happen in the future, right? And it's, it's that they could show you the spreadsheet that, the intern put together that came up with those numbers, but it's it's the presentation of numbers itself that make that people just assume oh what they're they must have measured something measurable they must have quantified something quantifiable uh, and yeah. that's something that I find really fascinating. For example, you see it in psychology where like teenagers these days are on average eighty percent less empathetic than they were twenty years ago. You know, <laughs> and it's like with with all those numbers and terms like average, and then they say research and study. You know, you assume there must be something real behind it, but often there isn't. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I mean, just this week, as we we we're, we're homeschooling here, so my my eleven year old daughter, she was, uh, she was having to to, to calculate some uh, some some averages, and uh, so she she got some numbers and she worked out this uh, an average, and she worked it out. And it was to she'd written it down to I think something like about eight decimal places, and these were all integers, <laughs> and she, and so she got eight eight or nine decimal places, and I said, well, you've got the right answer, but, uh, and I so I explained to her about uh, about how accurately you can uh, you can put things these the um, the numbers that she was talking about these were I think there were there were heights heights of people heights in centimeters or something like that or in millimeters and i said well but do you have a ruler to be able to measure to eight decimal places uh no <laughs> so okay well it can't be accurate to the eight decimal places well, well what should i do then well fewer fewer decimal places go, go fewer uh so i i basically had to teach her that uh, you know whatever the data uh, data you've got if it's measured to so many decimal places if you do an average of them, your average can't be more accurate than the, the same number of decimal places. So if it's measured to two decimal places, you can't be more accurate than two decimal places. It doesn't matter that the, that the numbers coming out of your calculator give you to 12 decimal places. You can't go that accurate. You just can't do it. But it gives people uh, reading, uh, reading the results a false sense of security in the numbers because they think because you've measured it to, you've got a number to so many decimal places this must be really accurate well no it's not it's not at all one one thing i found um uh in you know presenting in like a past life in presenting kind of financial information to people is that and that's often based on probabilities and you know upside cases and downside cases and things like that is that there's a certain sort of constituency that no matter how much you qualify the Informate the numbers and the charts that you're presenting saying this is based on a projection here are the assumptions they're all made up you know we're, we're assuming inflation of this over the course of the next 10 years and we're assuming this doesn't happen and this does no matter how much you qualify it there's a some proportion of your audience is just going to believe that you've made a prediction or you've or you've just told them the state of affairs have you found that with with clients sometimes that like no matter how much you tell them like you know this data that i'm presenting you is based on like I've done a lot of I've done a lot of like you know the technical term is cleaning you know I you you used the term when you were at the beginning of the interview where you talked about telling a story and things like yeah. that but people often I, I find it's very difficult with some people to get it across that this is this is a an an artificial thing that I'm presenting you with not a natural object that I found yeah um, human beings can't help but be human beings and we we all come into every conversation that we have with our own preconceived ideas uh, and it can be quite difficult to get past those preconceived ideas 
one of the things that we've had very, very big difficulties with as a company is that uh, we we create these these statistical applications, and a lot of the time, um, we we do it using artificial intelligence means. Uh, it can be very, very useful to to do that. Um, and as soon as you mention artificial intelligence, everybody's eyes light up, and they think it's some kind of magic bullet. It's going to fix all your problems. It's going to be, wow, fantastic, wonderful. It, it's not, it's, it's just a tool like any other. And you've got to be able to use, know how to use that tool. Uh, and the, it, it also confuses the hell out of them when I, uh, I tell them how much it's gonna cost too, because <laughs> they, they, they think you can just grab something off the shelf and, oh, it's done, it's five minutes, so it's done. You plug and play, you just throw your data in and out comes a prediction at the other end. It's brilliant, it's great. Yeah, it doesn't work like that. Yeah, we've all seen uh, the, yeah, the TV programs, your CSI and all these things, and anything to do with, with, with artificial intelligence. And they're just, yeah, somebody sitting at a keyboard, they tap away tick, 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 for five seconds, and oh, the answer is this. So, oh, are you kidding me? That would have been eight years' work <laughs> for somebody in the real world. And so, uh, people have got the wrong idea about so many things in society. Artificial intelligence is, is one of them, but there are many different things in which people uh, will come into a conversation uh, and, and they think that it's going to go a certain way, and, and it, it doesn't. It goes in a completely different direction. And sometimes it can be quite challenging for them to change their mindset. And it could be challenging for you to try to get them to change their mindset. And they need to change their mindset because maybe they've got the wrong idea about things. That's that's really interesting. It reminds me of, um, I think this is probably like an analogous, is something called the CSI effect. Have you ever heard of that? Well, CSI, CSI, that's my company, Chi Squared Innovations. Oh, that's true. <laughs> no, the the show, the show, crime scene investigations. Um, uh, sure. uh, and um, apparently, it had an effect on juries, like a real world effect on juries, where they're like, "Can't you just put it into?" Oh, I forget the name. There's some system. Like, can't you just put their DNA into the system and like, yeah, you know, or yeah. or, or can't Covis or something Covis like that. Or, I, I was going to say, yeah, something like that. Can't you just put their DNA into Covis and? And you know, just like have a montage uh, <laughs> and, and play some rock music or something, and then like you know, we, we're going to know the exact trajectory of the bullet through the five windows, you know, and, yeah. and in seconds, in seconds, yeah, and 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 looking great while you're doing it, uh, and um, <laughs> and yeah, no, I hadn't thought of that before, but I guess yeah, I can imagine that the the audience for certain kinds of data analysis when they're told things like when when they're they're told there's artificial intelligence involved in data science and things like that, that they might have all kinds of expectations about what's what's happening behind the scenes that don't necessarily match the kind of messy reality. Yeah, it's right. Uh, the, you, messy is the word, uh, because when we're talking about data, it's it, it's hugely messy. Uh, and the, the biggest elephant in the room is dirty data. Uh, it's a huge, huge problem. Uh, of course, if, if you're going to analyze any kind of data, whether you're analyzing it with statistics or with artificial intelligence or, or anything, if you put dirty data into your system, your system's going to crash. It's just gonna, not going to handle it. You've got to have perfectly clean data. Uh, and anybody that's done any data analysis or, or statistics knows this. And it is a huge, huge problem. There was uh, somebody I was talking to uh, a few years ago now, uh, and he, he, was, he was saying that, that their institute, uh, a, a large company, uh, I'm not going to mention the name, um, they had to, it's a pharmaceutical company, and they, they had to submit their data set to a, a, a national database uh, uh, for, for, for use by the, by the public. Uh, and this was mandatory. But before they could do it, they had problems with the data. It wasn't perfectly clean. It needed to be cleaned. So they went to a company to have it cleaned before uploading it to this national database. And they, uh, they got uh, the, their quotation, $72 million to clean this database. Oh, my God. $72 million. Whew. Yeah, so data clean is a huge, huge problem. Yeah, and I was actually just that, that gives us an opportunity to talk a little bit about what is what is dirty data. What's an example of, of dirty data, and how would you go about cleaning it? Yeah, dirty data. Um, 
if you were to take a, a single column in a data set, and in this column you've got you can have two possible uh, entries: the word positive or the word negative, whatever whatever they mean, doesn't matter. How many different ways are there of spelling the word positive? You can you can have it spelt all lowercase, all uppercase. You can have a, 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 a an uppercase p and all the rest of it lowercase. Uh, you can mix the case all the way through. And if you take all this data and you put it into a statistics program, it will see all these different ways of writing the word as different data. So it sees them as different things. So where you've got two possible entries, you've suddenly got lots of possible entries. You've got to clean all those up. And these are all just legitimate ways of writing down the word positive. What about if you misspell it? If you leave the E off the end or you add a full stop, how many different ways are there of misspelling the word positive? Actually, the answer is there are an infinite number of ways of misspelling the word, the, the word positive. And you cannot possibly account for every way of spelling it or misspelling it. And you can shorten it to pause and you could just put the, the, the sign, a plus sign in, in there instead, instead of the word positive. So, you know, these are, this is a great example of dirty data and it's absolutely horrible. And, and somebody like me has got to go in and clean all of that up. And the best way of doing it is actually to use uh, various artificial intelligence means to be able to do it. You've got, uh, there are lots of different ways in which you can do it because each different type of problem has got a different type of solution. Uh, one possible way is using uh, something called fuzzy matching. So if it sees the word positive, but you've missed a letter out, it can look at it and say, ah, this has got a, good, a really strong similarity to the word that we're looking for. So we know that it belongs to the word positive and not the word negative. So it can, it can force it to, to, to go one way or the other to be, belong to the correct category. Uh, I'm not going to go any further in, into the different ways of, of doing it, but there are many, many different ways. And artificial intelligence is actually the way to... Uh, to, to, to clean up all this this dirty data. And I'm, I'm really curious uh, just about the, the way the terms are used, like clean and dirty. So would, would for example, a survey that um, has selection bias in it. So for example, um, I think a famous one is with um, political polling where people call on landlines only. Uh, and so not only does someone have to answer the phone and then have a landline and answer the phone and then go, yes, I'd love to talk to this stranger for 10 minutes about my political views. And then you report the results saying, you know, 10% of people support this or something like that. Would that be, if that, if that, if a survey like that were part of a bigger data set of results, would that be called dirty data or would that just, would you just not apply that term to that situation? No, you wouldn't apply that term. Um, dirty data is, is data that is uh, incorrect in some way so as i said the the word positive if you misspell it that's dirty data you have to clean that data up the what you gave to me there was an example of a uh, a really poorly managed uh, survey where somebody has thought about a survey but they've not thought about it well enough they've not planned it correctly and so all the data that they've got is perfectly legitimate data it is clean data it is not uh, dirty data, but when you analyze it, you're going to get the wrong answer because they didn't plan their study correctly in the first place. Depending on what your motivation is, right? <laughs> if, if, Very much. Yeah, yeah. That, that, this, this is right into the center of my Truth, Lies and Statistics book. Yeah, no, I really, it's, it's really clear about that. So, for example, that someone can honestly be reporting and accurately reporting the results of something they did, but if they've designed it in such a way that you know, you want to present the general population as having the views of only people with landlines who like to talk on the phone to strangers, because you have a suspicion that there might be people like that might have certain be more likely to respond the way you want them to, then you can bake the result into the design of the study in the first place and still be and still be totally honest when you say I'm accurately reporting the results of my survey. 
Absolutely. I, I think I gave, gave an example in, in the book of uh, it's, it's really, really easy to, to, uh, uh, to construct a survey, which is absolute rubbish. And all you do is you send a survey out to somebody and the survey asks them one question. Do you like filling in surveys? And all those people that like filling in surveys will send it back to you. And all those people that don't like filling in surveys will file it straight in the bin. And so what you get is a is pro a hundred percent of people responding to you saying yes I love surveys, one hundred percent. Our survey said one hundred percent of people love surveys. Yeah, but you, it 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 means nothing because you, they, they, they it was poorly planned. That that actually leads me to ask. I'm going to ask. Sometimes I ask kind of selfish questions uh, because it's just a sort of particular hobby horse of mine. But one of mine is um, you know for example uh, when with respect to things like surveys, I guess it's a known thing that. If you ask questions in a different order, you'll get different responses to the very same questions sometimes. But of course, no one can, there's no systematic way of explaining, of predicting or explaining, predicting what results are going to be if you shift the order around or explaining why. But often I've found, and this is again, just as a lay person who sort of reads the news articles with statistics in it and stuff like that, there's this mysterious magical phrase corrected for. Um, that often appears like, you know, we, we correct, we corrected for age bias or something like that. And it's like, yeah. that's always struck me as complete bullshit. Um, you know, w what do you mean you corrected for unknowable things? Um, what am I missing? <laughs> uh, well, it, it all depends on who it is that's done the analysis on that one. They, it, it might have been uh, complete bullshit <laughs> and it might not have been because, um, we have something in statistics called uh, called confounding, uh, and you can correct for uh, various confounding things using various statistical techniques. So, uh, when you say yes, we corrected for age bias, uh, it, they may well have done that. It, it, there is a, a very strong statistical way of being able to, to, to do this. So it, it could be legitimate. Um, I think I'm not going to go any further on this because it's going to start to get technical in statistical things. And I, I, I don't think everybody <laughs> listening is going to be a statistician. You know, that, really understand what that's I'm okay. Say. No, so no, I'm thank you. Thank, thank you for that. And you know, I mean, I, I sort of, I, I put the, I put the, I put my question so naively that it really <laughs> didn't give you an opportunity to either answer 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 very specifically or generally. So my apologies for that. But it is something that I've just always kind of laughed at myself about. Um, and I know there's something underneath it that I completely don't understand. Um, but but speaking of of getting into statistics, so just uh, just before we move on to the last part of the interview, um, so your latest book is actually a collection of books um, called Getting Started with Statistics. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the bite sized guides that are currently in in this collection. Uh, one's data collection, the other one's data types, the third one is hypothesis testing, and the last one is Bayes' theorem and Bayesian statistics. Sure. Um, there are a lot of statistics books out there, uh, and most of them are written by statisticians for statisticians. And frankly, they're really, really difficult to penetrate. A lot of statistical books, uh, despite me being in statistics for 20 years, I can't understand them. Uh, so, th there are very few books written for beginners, people just getting started, people that have uh, they've they've collected some data. They, they they might be they might be doing some kind of research project and they've collected their data and they've got the data and now they've got to analyze it and they've got no idea where to start. Where do they where do they get started? Well, they need some help, and we've all been there where we've needed some help in a new subject, something that. Uh, some, something that we, 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 we've just got to get done. And so I, I, write, I write my books for the beginner, uh, for those people that really are just getting started. And that's what this series of, of books is, is all about. So I, I, I basically looked around uh, our website uh, at articles that I've previously written and said, can, can I do more with these? Can I, can I try to reach a, 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 a new audience and a bigger audience and try to get these to get this information out there to get to get people inspired and get them started and, and to get them to realize that actually statistics is not as hard as what they think it is. Statistics actually, most of statistics is not difficult. It's actually quite easy. 
Um, but when you read uh, academic papers and you read statistics books, you think it's really hard, but most of it isn't. And if you can, uh, if you can learn to do the simple things well in statistics, you'll have probably 80% of all the statistics covered and you'll be a good statistician, not the best because the best statisticians are those that have had got a PhD in statistics and, and that's, you know, that mantle is reserved for those guys. That's, that's fine. But your job is not to be the best statistician. It's just to make good decisions with data. And if you do simple things and you do them well, you will do a really good job with your data. And that's what I'm trying to get across with people. And so, so that's what this particular series of books was about. It's about trying to pull together things that I've written before that can inspire people to, to learn those, those easier things, the, 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 the things that's not so difficult. Yeah, and I can say, I mean, I, having looked at them, I think you succeeded quite well at that. Um, they're, they're really readable. They're great for beginners um, and a really good introduction to getting into statistics if it's something you're curious about and as ignorant about as, as I personally am. Um, <laughs> just moving on to the last part of the interview uh, where we talk a little bit about your experience writing and publishing. So you've, you've been, we were talking a little bit before we started recording the interview, you've been on LeanPub for quite a few years now. Uh, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about why you chose us as one of the platforms for delivering your, your books. Uh, that's taken me back a long time because I, I, I have I, my books have been on LeanPub almost as as long as you've been at LeanPub. Um, at, at the beginning, I I, I just I, I looked around. I got no idea where I could publish my books. I I, I think I I seem to think I started out at uh, at Smashwords, which is a, a, a distributor. Uh, so I I published books on. Smash words, and then it would go out to lots of different places: uh, Barnes and Noble, and Kobo, and uh, lots of different different distributors. Uh, and I, I just looked looked around, and I was just I, I was finding a lot of seeing a lot of books from LeanPub, um, and I was particularly I was particularly interested at that time in trying to promote uh, free books for our readers on our blog. Because I want to get them to, uh, uh, to 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 learn more about statistics and data science, and free is a it's the it's my favourite price. It's a wonderful price, and I'm sure it's everybody else's favourite price too. So I wanted to point people to free books, so, and and LeanPub was a great source of free books uh, when I when I f first got went on there. So I, I thought, well, okay, so if if other people are uh, producing books at LeanPub, why, why can't I produce books? Whether, whether for free or paid, it doesn't matter. The, the process is the same. The only difference is whether you, you know, whatever price you decide to put on it. Uh, and so I just decided I, I put them on, on, on LeanPub uh, as well. Um, and it, it's, it's, gone, it's gone really well. Um, we, we didn't sell many books at, at Smashwords through, through that, that, those, those, uh, those channels. Um, but LeanPub has, has been really, really good. And I think it's because um, I know there's, a, there's lots of different types of books at, at LeanPub, uh, but it, it seems to be a, a real big hub for, uh, for technical books. So uh, uh, programming and data science uh, are, are really big outlets uh, there. So it's, uh, it's, it's a bit of a home for the, for the, for the tech community uh, rather than such as a distributor which takes books on romance or pirates or whatever. Yeah, no, thank you very much for sharing that. The, um, the, the, the ability to have a free minimum price for books is actually something that's been very attractive, for particularly people doing exactly the kind of thing you're describing you were trying to do. Um, so, for example, I mean, but, you know, from another perspective, you know, people who might have uh, a very popular MOOC or massively open online course who also want to provide some learning materials along with it wouldn't mind, you know, maybe getting some revenue from that, but that's not the primary purpose. And so, you know, using any any platform that has um, variable pricing like we do is, is is really attractive, right? Because then if you've got someone, it doesn't matter where they are, what their financial situation is, or what their relative currency value is, they can they can get the learning material, or they can get on their way in their career or in their class or, or whatever it is. And so having a minimum price is actually really attractive, particularly to people in who are trying to teach, basically. 
And, um, yeah, and actually, so, and I, we, I leave these kinds of questions for the very end of the interview where we go into the weeds, but, um, so you, uh, use our bring your own book workflow on lean pub. So that what that means is that you can publish your book and you can use, you, you can do coupons and pricing and sales and stuff like that on the lean pub store, but you actually write your books in your own book production workflow and then you upload them to lean pub. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what tools you use to produce your Mobi and EPUB files. Sure. Um, it, th this this process has changed uh, over the years. Um, I, I've been through lots of different things, but what I what I, I I struggled with at first was that if you went to a distributor, you had to put your book there in a certain format, and if you went into LeanPub, you, it had to be in a certain format, and if you put it in uh, in Amazon, it has to be in a certain format, and and sometimes these formats don't go well together, so it c it could be quite difficult to um uh to get all these different formats so i i it's taken me a long time to figure out uh how to how to do the whole process uh and and come out at the other end with all of the formats of the book that i need for all of the different places that we're going to put it for no extra work uh, and actually there's there's an, an alternative distributor to to smash words and its name as a uh, draft to digital, I'd, I'd forgotten it for a second, but it's draft to digital. So what I do is I write my book in Word. Everybody knows how to write in Word. We all do it. Uh, and then I take the book and I upload it to draft to digital and it produces uh, a Mobi format and an EPUB format. And even if you want it uh, uh, as a PDF format, uh, albeit that that is only black and white. And once you've got those formats you download them and you've got them and then you can use them in wherever so i can use those e the the mobi and the epub and i upload them directly into leanpub and into amazon and into other places that we put them uh with no issue whatsoever so i go through Dra draft 2 digital anyway because they're a distributor so I go through that process, and then at the end, I, I, I get the downloads of, of the book that's been converted into the right formats that I need, and I immediately take them to the other outlets and put them there. Uh, and it, the, the, the process is, is really, really easy now. It used to be horrible before. I used to have to, have to write, write it in caliber. Uh, and and having to, uh, to to mess about with style sheets and uh, HTML and CSS and trying to get it right and oh I could spend days in just in formatting. That's after I've I've already written the book and then I've got to format the whole thing so that it, it works in the right format. Um, I don't have that anymore. It's very very simple process for me. Yeah, thanks very much for that. That's it's really interesting. Um, the so what? Yeah, what Lee's talking about for anyone listening who hasn't who hasn't gone through it is that often um, any any service that is going to convert a Microsoft Word document or any or a Calibre document or anything into a PDF into a Mobi or or a, or an EPUB file will give you a guide, right? So you have to format things in accordance with this guide, and those have definitely improved over the years, but. The, the, the formatting that you're doing isn't what you would typically think of as formatting, like, you know, formatting it. So how, how's it going to look on the page? You're formatting it to make sure that it corresponds to the guidelines that you've been provided with so that you get the right output at the end. And those services have, have really, really gotten a lot better over the years, which is which is uh, really good for self-published authors, uh, particularly those who like to work in they Word. Needed to, they needed to because the Smashwords guide to producing your book is, uh, I think, is about sixty pages long. It's it's huge, and you've got. You, and if if you if your book doesn't doesn't fit to the guidelines, it will get thrown back to you, and you've got to go and fix it. So it it, it can be a, a bit of a difficult process. Uh, so much easier since I've switched to Draft to Digital. Sorry, Smash Words. It, it was it was great while it lasted, but uh, Draft to Digital is uh, is is my my outlet of choice now. Oh yeah, everybody has their own preferences. We've actually had um, Mark Coker, the founder of Smashwords, on the podcast before. Sure. Um, talking about it, and so we're we're friends of Smashwords, and you know, like you know, people like some things and they don't like others. Um, the one thing I'll just say from our perspective that you know we we don't exactly find frustrating, but you know, we like to say to people, you know, if you if you just if you just learn Markdown in five minutes, you know, you won't have to learn all those, and then use LeanPub, you won't have to learn all those style guide things. But a lot of people are like, what are you talking about? You know, I don't I I know how to use 
what I already know how to use. I don't want to have to learn anything new. So yeah, it's like, you know, there's some people who are like, oh, thank God I don't have to do everything I the, the way I've always been doing it. And other people are like, the last thing I want to do is learn something new. I just want to write because I'm a writer and I want to reach people with my writing. Um, and so everybody has their own way in and their own way out too. I guess um, the, la the last question I always like to ask a guest if they're, a lean if they're an author who's publishing on LeanPub is um, if there was one magical feature we could build for you or if there was one thing you hate about LeanPub that we could fix for you, is there anything you can think of that you would ask us to do? Um, I think, uh, <laughs> to, to be flippant, I, I would say if, if you were to give us 150% a, a of the revenues, that would be <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, to, to be honest, I, I'm, I'm really excited about a, a new development at, at LeanPub. Uh, I'm not quite sure how, how new it is, but uh, I've recently discovered that uh, that you on your platform you now uh, have courses, and I've just been looking into it. And I've I've been doing courses on on our platform for for quite some time now, uh, and I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna put some uh, some courses onto um, onto LeanPub. I, I recently uh, produced some courses for. Uh, for, a, for a, a producer, um, and I, I have, um, although I, I had a deal with them, the deal was that I could, uh, I still retained the rights, and I could still do whatever I want with the with the course. So I'm I'm going to be putting those on on LeanPub very soon. So that this will be my first foray into uh, courses at LeanPub. So that you, you've already done what I what I wanted to do. Uh, you, you, your, your platform does courses. Oh, well, thank you very much for that. Yeah, we, we do. We, you can use LeanPub to make ebooks and publish them, and you can also use it to make courses. Um, it's uh, still a relatively underused uh, part of LeanPub, but part of our hope is that, I mean, partly because so many LeanPub books are, are, are um, intended to help people learn things, that actually if you've got a book and then you create a course to accompany it, then, <clears throat> excuse me, the person who's read the book can then get a kind of like social proof by getting a certificate by completing the course. Um, because right now, like you've read this whole book, you've learned everything in it, but you know, you can't put a, you know, a badge on your website or your CV or anything like that saying, and I took the course and I got an A or something like that. So that's part of the idea there is that, that hopefully the book, the courses will complement, complement existing books. But of course, a lot of the courses just exist on their own as independent things as well. Well, um, Lee, thank you very much for taking the time out of an evening, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to, talk to talk to us uh and thank you very much for using leanpub as one of the platforms for your books well thank you very much for, for talking to me i've uh, i've had an absolute blast it's been it's been great to be with you thanks and as always thanks to all of you for listening to this episode of the front matter podcast if you like what you heard please rate and review it wherever you found it and if you'd like to be a leanpub author yourself please check out our website at leanpub.com thanks <laughs>